Hey there. So let's start with the sixth reading and the main crux of this book now starts. <sighs> Chapter 4. The Discovery of India. The Indus Valley Civilization. The Indus Valley Civilization, of which impressive remains have been discovered by Mohanjadaro in Sindh and at Harappa in the western Punjab, is the earlier picture that we have, India, have of India's past. These excavations have revolutionized the concept of ancient India. Unfortunately, a few years after this work of excavation began in these areas, it was stopped and for the last 13 years or so, nothing significant had been done. The stoppage was initially due to general depression of the early 30s. Lack of funds was pleaded, although there was never any lack for the display of imperial pomp and splendor. The coming of World War II effectively stopped all activities and even the work of preservation of all that have been dug out have been ne rather neglected. Twice I have visited Mohan Jadaro in 1931 and 1936. During my second visit, I found that the rain and the dry sandy air have already injured many of the buildings that have been dug out. After being preserved for over 5,000 years under the coverage of sand and soil, they were rapidly disintegrating owing to exposure and very little have been done to preserve these priceless relics of ancient times. The officer of the archaeological department in charge of the place complained that he was, al he was allowed excavated buildings as they are. He was allowed practically no funds or other help or material to enable him to keep the excavation buildings as they were. What has happened during the last eight years, I do not know. But I imagine that the veering away has continued and within another few years many of the characteristic features of Mohan Jadaro will have disappeared. This is a tragedy for which there is no excuse and something that can never be replaced will have gone leaving only pictures and written descriptions to remind us of what it was. Mohan Jadaro and Harappa are far apart. It was sheer chance that led to the discovery of these ruins in these two places. There can be little doubt that there lies many such buried cities and other remains of the handiwork of ancient men in between these two areas. That, in fact, these civilizations were widespread over large parts of India, certainly of North India. A time may come when these works this work of uncovering the distant past of India is again taken in hand and far-reaching discoveries are made. Already remains of the, already remain of the civilization have been found as far apart as Kathiawar in the west and the Ambala, Ambala district in the Punjab. And there is a reason for believing that it spread to the Gangatic Valley, that it was something much more than an Indus Valley civilization. The inscriptions found in Mohanjadaro have so far not been fully deciphered. But what we know even thus far is of the utmost importance. The Indus Valley civilization as we find it was highly developed and must have taken thousands of years to reach that stage. It was unsurprisingly enough a predominantly secular civilization and the religious element, though present, had not dominated the scene. It was clearly also the precursor of later cultural period in India. Sir John Marshall tells us one thing that stands out clear and unmistakable both at Mohanjadaro and the Harappa is that civilization, hitherto revealed at these two places is not an incipient civilization, but one already age-old and stereotyped on Indian soil with many millenniums of human endeavors behind it. Thus, India must henceforth be recognized along with Persia, Mesopotamia and Egypt as one of the most important areas where the civilizing process were initiated and developed. And again, he says that the Punjab and Sindh, if not other parts of India as well, were enjoyed enjoying an advanced and singularly uniform civilization of their own. 
closely akin but in some respect even superior to the contemporary Mesopotamia and Egypt. Thus, people of the Egypt Indus Valley have important contacts with the Sumerian civilization of that period and there is even some evidence of an Indian colony probably of merchants at Akkad manufacturers from the Indus cities reaching even the markets of the Tigris and the Euphrates. Conversely, few Sumerian devices and arts, Mesopotamian toilet sets and a cylinder seal were copied on the Indus. Trade was not confined to raw materials and luxury articles. Fish, regularly imported from the Arabian sea coast, augmented the food supply of Mohanjadaro. Cotton was used for textiles even at that remote period in India. Marshall compares and contrasts the Indus Valley civilization with those of contemporary Egypt and Mesopotamia. Thus, to mention only a few salient points, the use of cotton for textile was exclusively restricted at this period in, to India and was not extended to the Western world until 2000 or 3000 years later. Again, there is nothing that we know of in prehistoric Egypt or Mesopotamia or anywhere else in the Western Asia to compare with the well-built bath and commodious, commodious houses of the citizens of Mohanjadaro. In these countries, much money and thought were lavished on the buildings of magnificent temples of the god and on the palaces and tombs of kings. But the rest of the people seemingly had to contend themselves with insignificant dwellings of mud. In the Indus Valley, the picture is reversed and the finest structures are those erected for the convenience of the citizens. These public and private baths, as well as excellent drainage system we find at Mohanjadaro, are the first of their kind yet discovered anywhere. There are also two-storied private houses made of baked bricks with bathrooms and a potter's lodge as well as tenements. Yet another quotation from Marshall, the acknowledged authority on the Indus Valley civilization, who was himself responsible for the excavations. He said that equally peculiar to the Indus Valley and stamped with the Indus individual characters of their own are its arts and its religion. Nothing that we know of it in other countries as at that period bears any resemblance in point of style to the fiance models of rams, dogs and other animals or to the intaglio engravings on the seals the, be the best of which, notably the hummed and shot horn bulls, are distinguished by the breadth of treatment and a feeling for a line and plastic form that have rarely been surpassed in glyph glyptic art. Not, nor would it be possible until the classic age of Greece to match the exquisitivity, supple modeling of the two human statues from Harappa. In the religion of the Indus people, there is much, of course, that might be paralleled in other countries. This is true for every prehistoric and most historic religions as well. But taken as a whole, their religion is so characteristically Indian as hardly to be distinguished from still living Hinduism. We find that the in this Indus Valley civilization connects and trade connected and trading with the sister civilizations of Persia, Mesopotamia, and Egypt, Egypt, and superior to them in some ways. It was an urban civilization where the merchant class was wealthy and evidently played an important role. The streets lined with stalls and what was probably small shops give the impression of an Indian bazaar of today. Professor Child says, it it would seem to follow that the craftsmen of Indian cities were to a large extent producing for the market what if any form of currency and standards of values have been accepted by society to facilitate the exchange of commodities is however uncertain. Magazines attached to many spacious and commodious private houses 
marks their owners as merchants. Their number and sizes indicates a strong and prosperous merchant society. A surprising wealth of ornaments of gold, silver, precious stone and finds of vessels of beaten copper and of metal implements and weapons have been collected from the ruins. Childs add that the well-planted streets and a magnificent system of drains regularly cleared out reflected the vigilance of some regular municipal government. Its authority was strong enough to secure the observance of town planning by law and the maintenance of approval lines for streets and lanes over several reconstructions rendered necessary by floods. Between the Indus Valley civilization and today in India, there are many gaps and periods about which we know little. The links joining one period to another are not always evident, and a very great deal has of course happened and innumerable changes have, been taken, have taken place. But there is always an underlying sense of continuity, of an unbroken chain which joins modern India to the far distant period of six or 7,000 years ago, when the Indus Valley civilization probably began. It is surprising how much there is in Mohanjadaro and Harappa, which reminds one of persisting traditions and habits, popular ritual craftsmanship, even some fashions and dress. Much of this influenced Western Asia. It is interesting to note that at the dawn of India's story, she does not appear as a pain-pulling infant, but already grown up in many ways. She is not oblivious for, of life's ways, lost in dreams of vague and unrealizable supernatural world, but has made considerable technical progress in the arts and amenities of life creating not only things of beauty, but also the utilitarian and most typical emblems of modern civilization, good baths and drainage systems. The crowning, the coming of the Aryans. Who were these peoples of the Indus Valley civilization and whence had they come? We do not know yet. It is quite possible and even probable that their culture was an indigenous culture and its roots and offshoots may be found even in southern India. Some scholars find an essential similarity between these people and the Dravidian races and cultures of South India. Even if there was some ancient, civil, ancient migration to India, this could only have taken place some thousands of years before the date assigned to Mohanjadaro. For all practical purpose, we can treat them as the indigenous inhabitants of India. What happened to the Indus Valley civilization and how did it end? Some people, among them God and Child, say that there was a sudden end to it due to unexplained catastrophe. The river Indus is well known for its mighty floods when overwhelm and wash away cities and villages. Or a changing climate may lead to a progressive desiccation of the land and the encroachment of the desert over cultivation areas. The ruins of Mohanjadaro are themselves evidence of layer upon layers of sands being deposited, raising the ground level of the city and compelling the inhabitants to build higher on the old foundation. Some excavation, excavated houses have, been, have the appearance of a two or three floory structures and yet they represent a periodic raising of the walls to keep pace with the rising levels. The province of Sindh, we know, uh, was rich and fertile in ancient times, but from medieval times onward, it has been largely desert. It is probable, though, that these climate changes had a marked effect on the people of those areas and their way of living, and in any event, climate change must have only affected a relatively small part of the area of the widespread urban civilization, which as we know, is reason to believe spread right up to the Gangetic Valley and possibly even beyond. We have really not sufficient data to judge. Sand, which probably overwhelmed and covered some of these ancient cities, also preserved them, while other cities and evidences of the old civilization gradually decayed 
and went to pieces in the course of ages, perhaps future archaeological discoveries might disclose more links with the later ages. While there is a definite sense of continuity between the Indus Valley civilization and later period, there is also a break or a gap, not only in point of time but also in the kind of civilization that came next. This later was probably more agricultural to begin with. Though towns existed and there was some kind of city life also, this emphasis on agricultural aspect may have been given to it by the newcomers, the Aryans who poured into India in successive waves from the northwest. The Aryan migration was supposed to have been uh, taken place. Uh, just a second. Uh, the Aryan migration was supposed to have taken place about a thousand years after the Indus Valley period, and yet it is possible that there was no considerable gap and tribes and peoples came in India from the northwest from time to time as they did in the later ages and became absorbed in India. We might say that the first great cultural synthesis and fusion took place between the incoming Aryans and the Dravidians who were probably the representatives of Indus Valley civilization. Out of this synthesis and fusion grew the Indian races and the basic Indian culture, which have distinctive elements of both. In ages that followed, there were many other races, Iranians, Greeks, Parthenians, Bactrians, Scythians, Huns, Turks, early Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians. They came, made a difference and were absorbed. India was, according to Donald, infinitely absorbent like the ocean. It is odd to think of India and her caste system and exclusiveness having this astonishing inclusive capacity to absorb foreign races and cultures. Perhaps it was due to this that she retained her vitality and rejuvenated herself from time to time. The Muslims, when they came, were also powerfully affected by her. The foreigners, said Vincent Smith, like their forerunners, the Sakas and the Yushchi, universally yielded to the wonderfully assimilative power of Hinduism and rapidly become Hinduized. So it's so today we will end with this and we will start from what is Hinduism from next chapter.